So just to give a brief, brief background on people who are new to West Talks or IC Impacts and Future Waters. So IC Impacts is a pan-Canadian, Canada-India research center of excellence, uh, which serves as a new model for international collaboration, uh, co-developing solutions to solve global challenges in the areas of infrastructure, health, and water. It is hosted at UBC and was established since 2013. Uh, UBC Future Waters is a UBC uh, research excellence cluster uh, on future states of water. It focuses on interdisciplinary research at the intersection of law, policy, and governance, and the applied and biophysical sciences. So just to give you a brief background on the organizing committee of Westox, uh, it's Abhishek, uh, Lady, myself, Carl, uh, Jaskaran, Kelsey, and Feria. And just to give a uh, brief perspective on the global picture of West Talks. Uh, so in the past one and a half years, uh, since we have started West Talks, we have reached pretty much every continent and we have active speakers from all across the globe. Uh, so uh, this is the lineup for this, uh, this terms uh, West Talks. And as you can see, we are in the second uh, talk today uh, by Dr. Nirupa Match from the University of Buffalo. And we have very exciting talks coming up all the way booked until June. And also for people who are new, uh, in case you have missed any of our West talks, or if you're interested in going back to any of our uh, talks that we have hosted in the past one and a half years, they are all available on IC Impacts' YouTube page. And you can uh, go and access, access them uh, free of charge. So uh, without much delay, uh, I'll introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nirupa Match. So Dr. Nirupa Match is currently an assistant professor at the University of Buffalo, the State University of New York. His research group, Ash Laboratory for Environmental Nanotechnology and Sustainability, is developing safe, safer and advanced multi multifunctional nanomaterials and nanotechnologies for environmental remediation and water treatment. As a recognition to his contribution to the field of environmental nanotechnologies, uh, Dr. Ash has recently received the 2019 Emerging Investigator Award from the Sustainable Nanotechnology Organization and 2021 Emerging Investigator Series paper by Journal of Environmental Sciences, Nano, the leading journal in the field. He's also an early career advisory board member in the editorial board member of a prestigious journal, the Journal of Hazardous Materials Letters. With that, uh, I would pass on to Dr. Ach to continue his presentation and we look forward to uh, listening to your, to your talk, Dr. Ach. Uh, thank you for her and thank you uh, the whole West Talks community for inviting me uh, for presenting. So I'll go ahead. Can you see my screen? Okay, sounds good. So let me put it on the... Okay. We're seeing presenter mode right now with uh, the yeah. notes on the side. Let, let me change that to regular mode. Okay, is that better? Yep, all good, excellent. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, let me, sure. yeah, so, uh, so I'll talk about materials for water treatment and I will go into the details uh, a little bit more uh, later. But um, first I would like to thank uh, the students and um, uh, in my group who has done most of the work that I'll be presenting. Uh, so actually not most of the work, all of the work that I'll be presenting. So, <laughs> so uh, I essentially just tell them to do and they do, but they contribute a lot. Like I mean, it's, it's really amazing how much they have contributed to the original ideas in, in many cases and how much they have done, uh, especially the uh, PhD students, Dr. Arvid Masood and Dr. Novin Mehrabi, they graduated last year. And one is working at Intel and another is working at a biosuppressions company called uh, uh, Royal Mal Multinational Company from uh, Dutch. Mm. So, but they have contributed most to the most of the work that we have done. I will be showing a little bit of uh, uh, their work, but uh, I'll be discussing what uh, else is going in in the lab. So there are a lot of uh, like uh, different students in undergrad and masters who has also contributed to the many of the research that I do. So uh, first, uh, the main issue that we uh, try to solve in our group is uh, understanding how we can solve 
uh, emerging and emergency pollution pollutants um, or treat them. So one thing that emerging contaminants that are like pharmaceuticals uh, and medicines that we take or parfluoroalkyl substances, paro and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS, I'm I'm hopeful that most of you know about them, but I will also discuss about them a little bit more. But uh, these are emerging contaminants. They are emerging contaminants because not because we uh, they are emerging now, but because we are finding them in water at this moment. So, uh, for example, in this, uh, the thing is that like in most of the cases, the you know, wastewater treatment plant, which gets a lot of these uh, used uh, chemicals, like from uh, municipal wastewater or industrial wastewater or agricultural, uh, uh, um, like agriculture, like all sorts of sources uh, that that wastewater treatment plant gets these pharmaceuticals or PFAS, the emerging contaminants. They cannot. Uh, the conventional technologies are not able to uh, uh, treat these contaminants. So that is the major issue, or they are very expensive to treat. So. Um, but so they end up in the uh, reservoir or in our drinking water sources. So the other problem is like in Flint, Michigan last year, uh, a few years back, um, uh, what happened that there was an emergency contamination. So the treatment of the lead or heavy metals were okay, but when they were distributed through the pipeline to individual houses, someone thought it might be a good idea not to add uh, lead corrosion inhibitors because that would save cost, but that created a whole public health crisis, uh, which uh, eventually led to criminal charges of those uh, people who were responsible in this water treatment plant. So the uh, thing is that like uh, those type of accidents can happen. So we call them emergency pollutants, right? So emerging and emergency pollutants need innovative solutions uh, for uh, treat you know, for uh, getting better uh, or safe water. So I would say like uh, there are a lot of work now, exciting time for nanotechnology and environmental nanotechnology uh, going on for water treatment. So these are several papers that uh, are really good introductory sources for understanding what are the roles. The first paper is nature sustainability roles of nanotechnology in tackling global water challenges, May basically take, talking about what are the global water challenges are and how we can address them with nanotechnology. The second paper talks about, okay, we have these opportunities, but there are also several uh, different challenges, right? Uh, talking about hazards of nanomaterials or talking about scalability or uh, what properties are important. So those things uh, are addressed in this paper, like overcoming uh, potential. The, then this nan nature nanotechnology paper also looks at system level thinking of sustainable design of materials and uh, looking at the performance hazard and economic consideration. So, uh, so going into this, um, I think for the, those who are not familiar with uh, nanomaterials and nanotechnology, I'd uh, give a brief overview. Uh, so we are talking about very small, almost atomic scale level um, uh, materials, right? So nanotechnology is basically material manipulation in nanoscale, which is one nanometer is equal to 10 to the power minus nine meter. So the idea is nanomaterials are typically uh, uh, like uh, called, um, um, defined by their dimensions. First, that is the criteria, at least one of the dimension uh, should be within one to 100 nanometer. For example, in the fullerene, which uh, is the first discovered carbon-based nanomaterial, uh, it's spherical and it has a molecular diameter of 0.7 nanometer, which is even uh, less than uh, one nanometer. So uh, the other thing, uh, so it's whole dimension, meaning in three dimension, it's within uh, one to 100 nanometer or less than that. So this is called zero dimension. Uh, but if we go to one dimensional and two dimensional structures, which are different uh, structural configurations of carbon, like carbon nanotube, the diameter can be within one to 100 nanometer, the, but the length can be infinite. So you can make, the idea was initially to make, um, hypothetically, you could make um, uh, nanotube um, uh, ladders to go from earth to moon. So that's how infinite it can be. So the one dimensional, um, one di D uh, t uh, really represents the length of carbon nanotubes that can be infinite or go beyond one nanometer, 100 nanometers. So similarly graphene, which is the um, like two dimensional, uh, basically planar sheet structure, like it's like a plain paper that you see 
so the atom scale uh, thickness, one atom thickness of uh, carbon, uh, carbon atoms that are arranged in, uh, in this shape. Basically, if you take out graph, uh, gra graphene, like individual layers of graphite, you can uh, end up getting into graphene and that's, uh, but it can, so the thickness can be within uh, nanometer scale, but uh, the Y and Z axis can go beyond, or X or X and Y axis, the other two axis can go beyond 100 nanometers. So that's the uh, thought about 2D nanomaterials. So on the other side, there are metallic nanoparticles. So any, uh, to be fairly holistic, any material or any element or uh, can be organized in a way that you can develop nanomaterials. So there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of different possibilities. So organic nanoparticles are there, like liposome, dendromite, polymeric nanoparticles are there, organic materials are there. Liposome has become a very important phenomena uh, based polymeric nanomaterials because of its ability to deliver drugs. And that's how the mRNA based vaccines for COVID um, you know, vaccines, they, these were developed. So we are actually living in the, um, and we have been living in era of nanotechnology for uh, quite a while, 20, 30 years, because of all the semiconductors that you see, uh, uh, electronics that you see, smart electronics that are made possible because we have electronics. Uh, uh, we have these nanomaterials which perform uh, extremely well. For example, the transistor uh, that is the key um, um, mechanism for electronics that was developed in 1947. And it was a thumb-like, um, it, it was this big like thumb-like structure uh, size. And now in iPhone 13, uh, which is the latest model of iPhone, we have 15 billion uh, of transistors. So that shows how miniaturization of uh, materials have expanded the electronics. The most important part in that is that not only the size, but here, the second part of the definition, nanoscale properties are remarkably different than bulk properties of the material. So it has to be there. It's not only that the size matters. The size matters because in nanoscale, the properties will change. So uh, the points are their sizes should be within this range, but then they will have different properties and the properties can change based on their size, shape, configuration, all these things. So uh, with that, we also have um, like if we talk about opportunities and nanomaterials, so these materials can be catalytic and they can be adsorbent. They have very high surface area, so you can use them as an adsorbent uh, in centralized water or drinking water treatment plants. But if you want to de develop modular treatment plants there, you can also use them as filtration uh, filtration device, inside filtration devices as nanoadsorbents or for oxidation or catalytic um, uh, processes. So you can use all them, uh, all of them. Even in case of pathogens, there are hierarchical nanomaterials or even single nanomaterials like silver nanoparticle can kill uh, bacteria um, in many cases because of uh, like um, uh, dissolution of silver ions. Uh, but also you can have catalytic nanomaterials that can react with pathogen bacterial pathogens or viral pathogens uh, to kill them. So there are many ways to do that. Uh, for example, the other thing is like you, if you have surfaces like membrane surfaces or solid surfaces where you have bacterial biofilm growth, then you can use like two dimensional materials that will physically perturb the cells uh, and um, like minimize the biofouling. So there are like different physical, chemical, biological ways that uh, nanotechnology can improve the water quality. But at the same time, we have challenges. Nanomaterials are expensive still expensive. The costs have gone down significantly uh, from the beginning, but still they are expensive. And uh, with mass production, we hope that the cost will uh, decrease more. But at the same time, as I said, the, uh, these are materials which are made from semi, uh, similar chemical elements that we use in other products. So uh, chemicals, uh, so the, these can uh, uh, create uh, challenges for toxicity or hazards in if they are released and to the environment, to the environmental organisms or when we are, uh, humans are handling these materials, uh, they can also get toxicity. So that's one thing to consider. I'm not saying that this is what is happening. I'm saying the, a huge field of environmental nanotechnology is actually looking into this. So um, all of, if we look into this, we have to both uh, look at the benefits. Like uh, if we use nanomaterials, they can 
uh, give better performance so we can reduce materials usage, improve water quality, and uh, we can develop modular processes for water treatment. But on the other side, we have to look at the life cycle impact and hazards that are coming with uh, these uh, cases. So we have to look both benefits and risks. So given that, um, uh, my group, what we do, we do nanomaterial synthesis, modification, and then we combine multiple nanomaterials for, uh, to make nanohybrids, which I'll talk in a little bit. Then we look at the new materials properties uh, that are important for application. And then we, uh, but, uh, and we do application in water treatment mostly. Uh, but at the same time, we are looking at safety of these materials for environment and humans. So uh, uh, then once we understand that safety issues, then we go back to the design of these materials uh, and see if we can change the material design to have better performance, but lower the to uh, toxicity or hazard. So that's why I, uh, we call it sustainable nanomaterial design or uh, design for advanced water treatment or smart uh, way. So before I go into the specifics of the projects, uh, I'll show what I have done in past. So in my graduate studies, it was not water treatment. I was using uh, nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes and graphene in uh, uh, structures, uh, structural materials like concrete uh, to enhance their uh, strength, uh, comprehensive strength, tensile strength, so on. And my, my expertise was and is majorly in understanding colloidal stability or dispersion behavior of nanomaterials and how you can functionalize them and surface modify them uh, to create certain chemistry so that they are well dispersed in water or on in other solvents that are desired. So I did that, then I had some um, interesting projects where we were using materials that are piece, uh, kind of like mechanic, uh, they are called tribaluminescent materials. So when uh, high pressure, uh, like um, high, load happens suddenly, then the crystals of these materials will light up. So you can use this uh, essentially uh, in, in structural health monitoring uh, in very like mostly in nuclear reactors where there you can set up cameras and or set up optical sensors uh, based on these materials uh, so that you can understand um, like uh, early crack or detect early crack or something like that. In So those were my master's projects. Then in PhD, I worked with uh, different carbon materials like uh, fullerene of different types uh, to understand how their colloidal interactions in water happens uh, and how that changes with changes of carbon numbers in, uh, in, in the fullerene. And we are also continuing that type of work where we are looking at different types of two-dimensional nanomaterials and how their uh, colloidal stability and fate in water uh, systems uh, can be explained by uh, like uh, theoretical DLVO, uh, like colloidal theories, okay? And on the other side, we have also looked into uh, antibacterial um, activity of metal nanoparticles, specifically uh, silver nanoparticles uh, and indium tin oxide nanoparticles and how like material properties like doping or environmental parameters like water's ionic strength or biofilm, the presence of biofilm, that how that impacts the antibacterial activity of metal nanoparticles. So, and then in the final stage of my PhD, I was working on uh, looking at nanohybrids, which I'll explain uh, more uh, in, in later stage, uh, meaning right after this, uh, and then uh, which is basically compositions of multiple nanomaterials. Uh, I looked at their fate and transport and toxicity, but now we are also looking at their uh, application for different water treatment. Uh, on this side, we are working on 3D printing for uh, nano-enabled water treatment. So we are trying to use uh, 3D printing to advance the manufacturing process of these technologies for water treatment. We are also working on membrane processes, like how to use two-dimensional nanomaterials to create antifouling membranes. Uh, so these are basically the water treatment projects that I have. Uh, and on the other side, this is completely different from what we do on nanomaterials. Uh, we do a nanomaterial toxicity study, but in Bangladesh, uh, we have a project on understanding global health impact of electronic waste or plastic waste that are being generated uh, globally. So uh, that is uh, uh, that is a completely different project, but uh, it's it's more of a humanitarian engineering perspective uh, rather than mostly water treatment perspective. So with that, I'll go into what 
I mean by nano uh, hybrid. So these are uh, cover articles that I published during my PhD, uh, which explained, uh, which basically identified uh, nano hybrids or uh, specialized nanomaterials uh, in environmental context. We defined them, we classified them, and we tried to show how they could be applied, but also we how we should be why we should be careful about their uh, toxicity and hazard in the uh, in the in, when we apply them. So what does mean by nano hybrid? Hybrid means um, to um, mixture of two different. It's not a mixture; it's more of a conjugation. So if you uh, look at these examples, like on the left hand side, we classified these different types of materials. Uh, based on their origin, like carbon, 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 metal, 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 and um, uh, organic um, with other metals. And on the right hand side, we have defined, like classified them based on their structures. So what uh, we want to say is like, if you see that carbon nanotube is conjugated with fullerene, the idea is that uh, when we conjugate like metal nanoparticles on graphene or carbon nanotube or any sort of conjugation of two or more than two, material happens, then each individual materials has their own properties, which can be enhanced, or we can combine multiple uh, functionalities to enhance uh, uh, an application performance. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the way most of the uh, applications has been going on right now. So if we look at, um, uh, look at uh, also the individual nanoparticle uh, uh, nanomaterial uh, platforms. Uh, one of the things that happened, like if we looked at uh, this one, like two-dimensional nanohybrid, nano where you are using graphene-based materials for uh, combining zinc oxide on the surface of the graphene. And I will explain why uh, we do that in a bit. But what we have seen that uh, over the last 15, uh, year, uh, 15, 20, uh, 15 to 16 years, uh, or a little bit more, after graphene came into being uh, in 2004, what we have realized that um, this two, uh, after that, there are a lot of different two-dimensional nanomaterials that are coming in, non-carbon, uh, metallic or uh, semi-metallic or super con uh, semi-conducting uh, two-dimensional materials coming in. What is good with them is that because they are sheet-like structure, you can stack them in different ways so you can control the structure. So you can use them as platform material for conjugating other materials. So you can use them to um, um, like stack different ways uh, without having like uh, having issues. So you can use them as supports. You can use them as shells. You can use them as uh, like um, uh, you, you can use them as a building struck uh, uh, building platform. So they are being used in different uh, platform materials. So we have uh, we have been kind of like uh, seeing a revolution of two D materials for uh, application. So. We, we wanted to see if we can use graphene for our application. So graphene is, as I said, graphite. If you take one single layer of graphite, which is all carbon molecule, uh, all carbon uh, solid structure, so you, we get graphene. But the problem uh, with using this graphene is that it's all carbon, so it doesn't have oxygen or nitrogen groups or other groups. So it becomes very hydrophobic or it becomes very, very, insoluble in different solvents. So uh, for processing uh, of materials, it becomes very difficult. So what we do is when we say we, it means researcher in this field, in nanotechnology field, uh, it was developed that graphene could be made as graphene oxide instead of graphene, where uh, you basically acid edge them and then functionalize them with different oxygen and groups, oxide or uh, carboxyl or uh, hydroxyl groups, and then you get uh, get uh, this um, high um, uh, high dispersibility, but at the same time you lose electrical conductivity that graphene offers. Le graphene is a typically a zero band gap uh, conduct uh, conductor, which is great, but we lose that conductivity. To retain this conductivity, you can reduce the graphene oxide, which is uh, which still owns uh, has some uh, functional groups to allow for dispersibility and retain the electrical conductivity. So that's what we use typically for uh, supporting different metal metal nano, metal oxide nanoparticles. So what we are using as the metal nanoparticle here is iron. 
And iron nanoparticle is typically the most used nano engineered nanomaterial for soil and groundwater remediation. And they are applied uh, to 77 pilot and field scale sites. Uh, the, the main advantage is that iron can um, be in iron zero form or in different redox form, right? Iron three plus and iron two plus. So they can move between these uh, form, uh, forms and you can have adsorption or catalysis or reactions uh, to uh, treat different organic and inorganic contaminants at the same time uh, using these uh, iron nanoparticles. But the problem is iron is magnetic and also has high van der Waals attraction force. So they will agglomerate and they will not retain in their nanostructures. Uh, they will become micron scale and they will become larger so that they will lose the reactivity and surface area. So what we can do, we can put them on either like carbon-based surfboards like carbon nanotube or graphene either on two dimensional or one dimensional structures where these carbon based structures can give large accessible surface area, but at the same time they are carbon based. So they will attract different types of contaminants. Uh, and uh, they also have high electron mobility. So when these iron nanoparticles will release the electrons, they can move very fast and will do, enhance the reactivity. So, so on, including all this, it becomes really attractive for us to study this. So wh what we try to see uh, is, is first, does the one dimensional or two dimensional with, uh, nanomaterial or support, which one gives much better performance? So we wanted to make these nanomaterials using a uh, ultrasonic spray pyrolysis process. Uh, like for example, here, if you look at, um, let me enter. Okay, so here we are using micro droplets, very small droplets of water uh, suspensions with these different types of sol iron salts with carbon nanotube or graphene or without any of them, any of the support. We uh, aerosolize them and flow through furnace at 800 degrees Celsius uh, to furnace. And then we get different types of iron carbon uh, nano hybrid. So iron CNT, carbon nanotube or iron graphene oxide uh, reduce graphene oxide or just the iron nanoparticles. So what we saw first in the, in the size, so if we don't have any support like carbon nanotube or graphene, the size of nanoparticles, iron nanoparticles go to 200 to 500 nanometer, which is more than 100 nanometers. So they are not really in nanoscale, but at, when we have carbon nanotube, we can get small, as small uh, iron nanoparticle as 10 to 2, uh, 25 nanometer. So if you look at these other string-like structures, uh, around this uh, small iron nano particle, those are basically carbon nanotubes. On the other side, if you look at here, the graphene sheet, it is actually a single graphene sheet. It looks like bed sheet, uh, but um, that is having a lot of eight to 50 nanometer size iron nano particles. So what we have seen is, is that if we look at chromium removal capacity, which is chromium is a toxic, uh, um, uh, toxic heavy metal, that is found in industrial wastewater. Uh, and if you want to remove it uh, using different types of nanomaterials, what we found that this iron graphene nanomaterial performs the best uh, in uh, compared to iron carbon nanotube or iron nanomaterial. So iron nanoparticle we understand because it's not nanoscale anymore. So it doesn't have the absorption or reactive capability as much as the nanoparticles here. But what happens in carbon nanotube versus graphene is that when this carbon nanotube uh, and iron droplets go through the furnace because these are a lot, many of many, a lot of carbon nanotubes, tube-like structures, string-like structures. They go through this uh, furnace. They become uh, and the water goes away. Basically, they collapse and they form a porous structure. And the elect, um, the irons are inside them. On the other hand, um, in case of graphene, in when they go, uh, these individual sheets go through this furnace at high temperature, they actually separate out from each other. They don't collapse to each other. Uh, they have an exfoliation uh, uh, case. So each individual uh, graphene sheet will have uh, on top and bot bottom, both sides exposed with uh, metal nanoparticles on them. So the uh, chromium can get access, more access, easy access uh, to the surface. So that's what happens. So we believe that that's why the reactivities are different. And we con conclude that uh, iron graphene structure, so the 2D, two-dimensional structure gives us better performance uh, for contaminant removal, okay?
So once we have done that, so that was kind of a model system that we tried. We tried to look at what are the uh, important contaminants that we should be looking at. So we did tests with uh, PAR and polyfluoroalkyl substances, and we also looked at different pharmaceuticals uh, to treat uh, um, these uh, compounds with uh, our iron graphene uh, nanohybrids. Uh, but I will only discuss the PFAS um, experiments here, study here. So uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, PFAS, is if they are uh, these fluorinated organic compounds, like uh, this carbon chain with uh, like uh, carbon chains of different plants um, uh, can be like, um, but with uh, a head group here, uh, that could be carboxyl group, hydroxyl group, or, or different types of groups, but they are carbon and fluorinated, fluorinated carbon structures, which are extremely stable in any environment. Okay, the reason that uh, the reason we use them from 1940s uh, in different products like shampoo, uh, conditioner, like uh, food packaging, then firefighting foams, and in basically all almost in all types of products, we use them as fire retardants. We use them as uh, like non in non sticky cook pans. We use them because we need high temperature. Uh, resistivity. So we use them because they are stable, highly stable, highly durable. But at the same time, when they go into the environment, when they are leached from these materials or when they are being produced and uh, in manufacturing plant and they are releasing those in the environment, they are also remaining uh, persistent and like um, stable in the environment. So biodegradation doesn't happen, photodegradation doesn't happen, no sort of, no degradation happens. So there are more than actually more than 5,000 different types of PFASs out there in the environment and they become very persistent because of their stability and because, because the main reason is the carbon fluorine bond in their structure is very strong and difficult to break down. So that is the main criteria. So the stability we wanted, we got, but at the same time we got the hazard. So this is one of the major issue that the world is facing now, almost 99% uh, people in the planet are believed to have uh, PFASs in their bloodstream. Uh, so that's uh, so. If you haven't watched it, uh, please do watch uh, Dark Waters, the movie Dark Waters. Or John Oliver has a skit on 40, uh, 20 minute skit on PFAS. Uh, you can watch them to learn about them. So, so we are trying to solve this uh, problem uh, by using uh, reduced graphene oxide, nanoscale zero valent iron, nanohybrid RGNZPI. Uh, one, one process is that can we absorb uh, these uh, uh, PFASs on the surface of the graph, uh, uh, these hybrids, or can we use catalytic property of the iron to degrade these PFASs uh, on the surface of the um, um, nanohybrid? So uh, what we are trying to do is uh, we are taking different, uh, like several PFASs with different head groups and chain length uh, at uh, sub PPM level concentration, and we are actually, sorry, my dogs are fighting. No, it's okay. So, and um, we, we are trying to do both adsorption and advanced oxidation process because only separating them is not going to solve the problem. We need to uh, actually degrade them, okay? So uh, what we try, uh, try to do to understand if our materials have uh, degradation capability, we uh, what we did, we uh, create, uh, looked at hydrogen uh, peroxide decay using different materials. So this is like hydrogen peroxide uh, over time, uh, that's not decaying, but we put uh, reduced graphene oxide, uh, NZVI, which is the iron, and this nanohybrid, which is a combination of the reduced graphene oxide and uh, hydrogen uh, uh, NZVI. So we put them through, uh, like expose these materials to this hydrogen peroxide and see how much of the hydrogen peroxide decay. So what it means is this hydrogen peroxide decay, how fast this hydrogen peroxide decay means, how fast uh, hydroxyl radicals or reactive oxygen species are being generated by this catalytic property of these materials. So this is kind of an indirect uh, way to compare these materials. So what we have seen the fastest uh, uh, decay of this hydrogen peroxide was based on the uh, by the nanohybrid. So we we wanted to see if that also uh, increases the uh, degradability of the uh, like PFASs or uh, can absorb the material uh, PFASs more. 
So, uh, so this is kind of the reaction mechanism that goes on on the catalyzed surface. Uh, iron zero, uh, it reacts with the hydrogen peroxide and creates iron two plus. And then iron two plus eventually reacts with hydrogen peroxide to go to uh, iron three plus and then create hydroxyl radicals or hydroxyl ions. Uh, similarly, iron zero will also react with oxygen and water uh, to uh, give hydroxyl ions. So overall, these hydroxyl ions and hydroxyl radicals, free radicals, they will uh, react with, um, uh, and it, it's not only hydroxyl radicals, it could be also um, other radicals like oxygen radicals or other radicals, but mostly hydroxyl radicals are the predominant um, radicals that uh, perform the reactions for advanced oxidation process. Okay, so we, we took two different, uh, four different PFASs, two short chain, which are less than five uh, uh, carbon, and then two long chain, eight carbon chain. Uh, uh, PFASs, which are most well-known P4 and PFOS. Uh, we had these different uh, nanomaterials, NZVI, graphene oxide, and two NZVI. And we did two sorts of experiment. One is without hydrogen peroxide, which gives us mostly uh, absorption. So we put the PFASs inside with solid materials in them, uh, PFAS solutions in water. And then uh, same thing with hydrogen peroxide. So, and then after some time, we uh, centrifuge them to uh, uh, remove the nanomaterials and then uh, take the supernatants to run through the liquid chromatography mass spectroscopy to identify the PFASs that are present there or any degradation product there. So first, uh, what we have done is we looked at the fraction removal by different PFASs using these different materials. So uh, on this side, you see without hydrogen peroxide and on this side uh, with hydrogen peroxide. So basically what we saw is that if you look at the removal percentage, uh, so PFOSs, the long chain PFOS, PFOSs are mostly removed, uh, uh, like more removed than short chain PFOSs. This uh, five carbon one was very less removed, like 40% at best. Uh, on the other side, we got 95% removal with highest 95% removal with the PFOS and PFOA. So uh, PFOA is not that much, 60%. So what the major uh, thing is that with increasing carbon uh, number, uh, their hydrophobicity or log KOW values increase. So they become more attached to the graphene structure, which is graphene backbone in the GNZVI nanohybrid, which is hydrophobic, right? Uh, like which is carbon-based. So that's why we see more uh, removal of uh, larger PFASs than smaller PFASs. The other one we saw is that the nanohybrids, if you look at the nanohybrid peaks compared to the single nanomaterial like RGO and NZVI, nanohybrids remove PFASs faster uh, than the graphene or NZVI. The other one is we are testing between hydrogen peroxide and without hydrogen peroxide. So AOP, advanced oxidation process, is removing much faster than the uh, uh, better and faster than the absorption process. So if we look at the overall uh, difference, like this is the nanohybrid with hydrogen peroxide and this is the nanohybrid without hydrogen peroxide, okay? So even fast, like if we look at the time, time with time, so within five minutes, the difference is like uh, with nanohybrid without hydrogen peroxide, just by absorption, we are getting 50% removal where almost 95%, 90% removal with hydrogen peroxide. So that's what the difference is. So we are seeing the catalytic activity of the nanohybrids here. Okay, so what uh, we, uh, because, uh, but the question is, are we are seeing oxidation, but are the degradation really happening? So what we uh, tried to do is we did uh, high resolution mass spectroscopy uh, to identify different unknown products. So what we have found that they have not reduced to very small um, uh, 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 carbon, uh, carbons or hydro, uh, carbon hydrogen uh, structure, but uh, they have reduced. So we have a C7 and C6, like two, one and two carbon, uh, reduction we have seen also fluorine reduction we have seen so we are seeing uh, carbon decarboxylation and uh, defluorination partial defluorination uh, in this process uh, by oxidation so this is kind of the possible mechanism so basically uh, the PFOS which is a sulfonic uh, sulfonated group uh, PFAS with sulfonated group uh, eight chain length uh, uh, that is getting 
first that is becoming P4 in this process is if we, if we look at here, uh, this is becoming P4 and eventually the P4 is actually reacting with different reactive species mm -hmm. and creating a much smaller uh, foot. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a different structure that is uh, being present but eventually um, I, the other reactions are not shown here, but basically this, uh, this um, I think in the next one. So basically if in the first step, we see from PFOS, we get the sulfate and one fluorine uh, uh, coming out, then it all becomes PFOA and the PFOA releases fluorine, uh, fluorine first. And then they also release two carbon, uh, one methylene group and one carboxyl group. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they are actually attaching uh, the iron on the structure. So that's what we have found. So we don't know exactly what the configuration is, but we know that the molecular structures have a PFAS iron complex, which is becoming a stable also. So we have to look into uh, their stability, uh, if further uh, oxidation is possible or further degradation is possible in this process or through biocatalysis, either through photocatalysis or by Catalysis. So, can we uh, can we use them for groundwater or soil remediation too? So, we we are trying to look at the exact structures with a collaboration uh, from uh, um, Dr. Scott Simpson from uh, Saint Bonaventure University, who is looking at molecular uh, uh, modeling uh, using density functional theory to look at different structures of the PFAS iron complex that we are getting uh, after the two defluorination and uh, decarboxylation. So uh, we are basically, uh, we, are, we have probable structures of this PFAS iron complex and we are trying to see which is uh, the, the most probable uh, through uh, theoretical calculations. So, and at the side, we are doing experiments to actually look at the nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectra to identify the molecule, actual molecular structures of the material. So we will do both theory and uh, theoretical calculation and experimental evidence to find out the exact structures of the PFAS iron complexes that are being produced by the degradation process so, so that we can further degrade them. So that's, that's, uh, that's a project uh, like that we are doing. The, on the other side, we are uh, currently funded by National Institute of uh, Environmental Health Sciences, uh, where we are looking at uh, this uh, new type of material, photocatalytic material with, we are combining titania with these iron materials to degrade these materials further. We are doing enzyme discovery, but we are also focusing on, uh, can we treat these uh, uh, PFASs with these nanomaterials, then put them uh, uh, to biological wastewater treatment so that the bi microbes uh, that, that can degrade these uh, um, PFAS as faster because they are very difficult to degrade. So we are not taking one approach, we are taking multi-pronged approach to attack this problem, the PFAS problem actually, okay? So, but at the same time, as I said, we also look at the toxicity of the materials. So we have, I will not go into the details, but we have been looking in uh, lung cell toxicity uh, of these uh, nanomaterials that we are producing, basically the nano hybrids that we are producing. So if we go from single material to Two, uh, two material combination, how that is changing the toxicity. So we have seen some evidence that the toxicity of uh, graphene uh, is reduced or in the other way, iron has been increased, uh, but so it's in the middle of the two parent nanomaterials, the toxicity of the hybrid material. So we are still investigating the actual mechanisms of that. At the same time, we are looking at uh, if these materials are released in uh, wastewater, uh, how they are going to impact the biological wastewater treatment plant or uh, microbes. So we are both looking at uh, human cell lines, but also we are looking at microbiological uh, implications of these nanomaterials that we are producing more. So these are papers that has been recently out. So uh, I'm not going into the details, but we are looking at the toxicity aspect. As I said, uh, we have to understand the uh, problem more. The other, uh, so what is the solution? So what I think is uh, the solution is that, uh, so, uh, so one thing we have to look at the sustainability, our goal is to go with nanotechnology for water quality engineering. We have to look at the sustainability of the materials that we are producing uh, 
uh, where we look at safer design. So we are working on uh, developing newer methods, newer reagents that are green, uh, green chemistry approach to do safer design. But we also have to look into uh, life cycle impact of these new materials uh, overall. The other one is like advanced manufacturing. So these nanoparticles that we are working with are particle based. Uh, so they can have release and exposure. So we need to go into manufacturing level to scale up this, not only the process of manufacturing these materials, but also how we can combine these materials with different uh, water treatment processes already or devices already uh, to enhance the process. So we are using 3D printing for that. Um, uh, and the other one is the data-driven design. So over the past six years, as you have seen, I, we have worked with only one type of material, graphene iron nanohybrid. So if I want to change the material and go into different material, there are hundreds of different possibilities of uh, materials. There are 5,000 different PFASs. So can we test them all in lab? No, we can't. So we have to come from a, um, theoretical point of view and look into materials informatics or chemistry informatics and kind of combine this idea, like uh, basically reduce the number of experiments by first calculating the properties of the materials and the pollutants and then seeing which are uh, the best candidates to test. So I think these are the three different ways we can advance the nanotechnology in the new decade because we like what we are uh, seeing our promises, but we also have challenges and we need to overcome them. Okay, so uh, with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, a lot of collaborators at UB and outside of UB and all the funding agencies that have been, uh, that is making the work possible. And with that, uh, I'd like to take any questions that you have. Sorry.